why shouldn't we be giving them assistance to ride out this crisis? Well, look, I would say we are giving them assistance. I mean, we've, we've lessened some of the restrictions around the number of hours that um, people can work on student visas, for instance. We're allowing uh, people to stay with one employer for longer than six months than was previously the case. We're allowing them to access superannuation. So we are taking a number of measures to support these people. Look, I think... The first and foremost of duty of any government, though, is to its citizens. Uh, we certainly have a responsibility to the other people that are in Australia. I accept Peter's point on that. Um, and look, this is an area we continue to look at, you know, actively on a on a day by day basis. Okay. Well, I've got two um, foreign affairs aficionados um, with me, so I want to sort of head overseas. Um, one of the, um, I suppose, well, there have been many, many bad aspects of this crisis, but one of them is. China's response, um, the criticism that China initially covered up uh, information regarding the coronavirus. Then there's the misinformation being spread that the virus was brought to China by America. Dave Sharma, does Australia have a responsibility here to be calling out what is clearly misinformation in a time where people need accurate information? Well, I think the whole world has a collective responsibility and I'd certainly expect us to step up to this afterwards to, to learn some lessons from this crisis and see, you know, where there were failings, where there were shortcomings, what could be done better. And I think it's certainly it's, it's pretty clear to me that in the early stages of this crisis, organisations like the World Health Organisation weren't as intrusive or demanding as, as they should have been. Um, there's certainly failings in terms of the internal management within China. I don't think that was done with any, any malice or design. Uh, but I think it's something that we're all going to have to learn from as a globe and I'd expect us to have a, have a bit of a reckoning afterwards about what we have to do differently in the future to ensure this sort of thing doesn't repeat itself. Peter Khalil, do you agree with Dave Sharma there that the WHO, well, I suppose you're effectively implying there that um, felt some political pressure by China in terms of its its early responses to this crisis? Well, Dave, David is a fine uh, diplomat in the past. He's an MP now, but he's a fine diplomat. I'm not as diplomatic as Dave, even though I've got a foreign affairs background. I'm going to be quite blunt about this. I've got two, two points about this. First, for all the people domestically who are shouting racist abuse at Chinese Australians and Asian Australians, uh, you know, stop. You're being idiots. These people had nothing to do with the coronavirus. It's blind, misplaced anger and hatred. If, if any anger should be directed, it should be directed at the Chinese Communist Party because the wet markets that existed in Wuhan and uh, in other parts of China with no safety and health regulations around there is where those viruses emerged, including SARS 20 years ago or 18 years ago, as well as um, uh, avi a uh, avian flu as well. Uh, and then not only did they have no um, regulations around that and allowed that those viruses to emerge, they then tried to cover it up for a number of months. And you talk about the pressure on the WHO, but even it was as late as January before they admitted to the rest of the world. So it put everyone on the back foot. So there is a degree of responsibility and accountability that China has with respect to um, the coronavirus and COVID-19. We would hope that the international community, and I would hope the Australian government plays a part in this, um, holds China to account on this and seeks to have them play a positive role as a global citizen in the global economic recovery. How do we hold also... China to account, Peter Khalil? There have been so many of these um, instances before. I mean, obviously the coronavirus is catastrophic in its nature, but how do you hold China to account? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Jane, the international community has to work together to say to China, enough is enough. Enough nonsense on the South China Sea and uh, shoveling sand around islands. Uh, enough nonsense with the foreign interference. Play a positive role in economic recovery and from pressure from all of the international community on China to do so. We could see um, progress with respect to reduction of global emissions, which China is responsible for 30 per cent of global emissions. We can see China playing a positive role in the global economic recovery. They want to do that. They've been trying to assist with aid. So let's work on that. Uh, and do that post-pandemic. But it has to be a concerted effort by the international community to say enough is enough. All right, Dave Sharma, just going back to your comments earlier about the World Health Organisation, do you think that this um, uh, coronavirus crisis has... Well, do you think the WHO has lost some of its standing? Are we going to be looking to the WHO to lead um, responses in future, given the criticism that has been levelled at this, um, this institution? Look, I think if you didn't have a body like the World Health Organization, you'd have to invent it. You do need some neutral international body that allows states to cooperate, share information and coordinate responses to this sort of thing. But undoubtedly, I think the WHO has revealed some serious shortcomings and I think they've revealed themselves to have been a, a politicised organisation, which, you know, it happens in the UN system. There's always a bit of real politic there. But I think particularly when you're dealing with a, a, a 
what's meant to be a UN expert agency and one that's dealing with an issue as important as global public health, uh, you need to expect higher standards. I think, you know, their attitude towards Taiwan has been um, bizarre throughout this, given Taiwan has got important lessons for the rest of the world and how to manage this effectively, uh, and their attitude towards China, I think, um, being um, uh, too willing to accept Chinese explanations for this virus and the source and the causes and whatnot. That so, has a lot to do with the funding. All right. Well, well, yeah, but the, I mean, the United States is the largest funder of the WHO. China's quite small, yeah. but China undoubtedly, you know, plays politics with multilateral organisations. I would just, I mean, look, I think Peter makes some good points, though, Jane, if I could just res respond to those mm -hmm. or, or add to those. Look, I think the point to note here is China is not the Democratic Republic of Congo or something like that. It's a country that has world leadership aspirations. It's a nuclear weapons state. It's a, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. We expect it to observe high standards. And if a country lets out, for instance, nuclear fissile material into the world community, the world community rightly responds with anger and consternation mm. and demands some sort of transparency and accountability in the future. This coronavirus has been as disruptive as any sort of global security threat that we faced at any time in the past, and so the response needs to be commensurate with that. All right, Dave Sharma, Peter Khalil, I'd love to talk more, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining me on Afternoon Briefing today.